So, well, as uh, Agatha has already mentioned, the title of this talk is Behold, because I'm going to show you the happy path to captivate your users with stunning CLI apps. My name is uh, Jorge Vasquez, and I'm a Scala developer at Scala C. And also this year, I had the privilege to become a Zio trainer as well. So if you are interested in Scala's Zio trainings, uh, or your team is interest, interested on them, you can visit our webpage at Scala.io. I've also included the QR code there uh, for you guys if you're interested. Or even better, for those of you that are uh, on site there in London, you can uh, visit our booth, our Scala booth, where my teammates will be happy to uh, explain uh, all the things uh, you want to know. So, okay, so let's start with the presentation itself. So first I want to discuss, so why we need a CLI apps, command, command line uh, applications. So, well, the reason is that uh, CLI apps uh, make your work scriptable, testable, and usable by non-developers, right? So this is like the main motivation. Uh, maybe we want to give access to some API or maybe something around some data processing task or maybe others. And there are very nice examples uh, of uh, very professional CLIs in the industry like AWS uh, CLI or the Git CLI, very known uh, by all of us. And now the problem is uh, how we can implement production grade CLI apps, right? Production grade CLI apps means these apps that are very powerful with nice documentation, such as the AWS CLI or the Git CLI. They are very typical examples for this. And well, maybe some of us uh, may think, hey, well, that's a piece of cake, right? But not so fast, my friend, because there are several things we need to handle. For example, uh, we need to think about command line parameters. Uh, we need to validate uh, users' uh, inputs. And we need to handle uh, also documentation for our app. And well, first focusing on the first part. So we need to handle command line parameters. And here, there is also several things we need to consider. There are several types of command line parameters we need to handle. Uh, for example, options, which are uh, named parameters. Uh, there is also arguments, which are unnamed parameters, and subcommands as well. So several types of arguments of parameters, right? Uh, when we are handling options, which are these um, named uh, parameters, for example, here we have a message option in the Git CLI. Uh, we should consider that, for example, they must be order insensitive, right? So if we execute this first command, like we are providing a message option and then an author option, it should be the same as first providing the author and then the message, right? So we need to consider that when handling options. Uh, also, we need to handle flags, for example, and flags are a, a special kind of options. So they are also named, but in the case of flags, like this verbose flag, in this example here, uh, we don't need to provide an explicit value, right? Because this option, this flag, uh, is uh, under the hood just a Boolean option. And basically, if you include the flag, the value is assumed to be true. And if you don't include it, the value is assumed to be false. So that's something special, and a special case uh, inside options. Uh, we also need to handle variations. So for example, this command, where we're providing a message option and the value separated by space should be the same as uh, separating the value by the equals sign, right? And it should also be the same as uh, providing a short version of the option. So instead of saying message here, I'm saying just M, right? So I have a short version of that. So I need to be handled, I need to be able to handle all of those uh, variations. Or for example, if I have a command where I'm uh, providing uh, several uh, short options, 
one after the another, I should be able to group them together, right? And that should be also recognized by the application. So that's just for options, right? Several things we need to think about. And now about the uh, arguments, which are uh, unnamed parameters. So for example, here we have a very typical example calling cat uh, in Linux, right? And it accepts an unnamed argument. So the file we want uh, to uh, print to the console, right? So we need to handle this case as well. And uh, comparing to options, uh, arguments are order sensitive, right? So we also need to take care about that. So for example, if we call the copy command uh, with two arguments, uh, it's not the same as if I change the order of the arguments, right? Because uh, the first argument means the origin and the second argument means the destination of the copy process, right? So arguments are order sensitive. We need to handle that as well. Uh, there's also variables, right? So for example, cat accepts uh, several files that you can provide as arguments, right? And in that case, cat will print all the provided files to the console. So variables, something important as well to consider. Uh, so several things about arguments. And also we have subcommands. Besides all of that, uh, all of those cases for options and for arguments, you also need to handle subcommands, right? So for example, uh, git has several subcommands like clone or add or commit. And each of those subcommands uh, has its own set of options and arguments, right? So that's another level of a complication we need uh, of complexity we need to consider okay so that's everything we need to think about uh, command line parameters and uh, besides all of that we also need to validate user inputs right uh, we don't want users to introduce invalid data to our application and uh, there are two types of validation we need to think about there is pure validation and also impure validation what I mean with pure validation is that uh, we need to validate whether an option or an argument that our uh, uh, user is providing is, for example, a string or an integer or a date time or other data type, right? So this pure validation just validates the data type, basically. Uh, so for example, here, I'm calling this tail command, very typical, with an illegal offset, this n option here. This offset should be an integer, right? And here the user is providing an invalid string. So we should get an error like this. Like uh, here it says illegal offset, right? Because it's not a valid integer. But there is also impure validation. So impure validation happens in the cases we need to verify a connection between a, an option argument and the real world, right? So for example, does the given file actually exist? or is the given a URL valid, right? So we need to validate those cases as well. And that's impure because we are doing real interactions with the outside world uh, to do uh, the required validations. So for example, here, again, I have this tail command example. And here I'm trying to call the command, but with a file that does not exist. So in those cases, uh, the CLI app also should uh, give us a nice error message, like in the example here. Uh, well, so there is also validation we need to handle. And besides all of this, we also need to handle documentation, right? Because uh, it doesn't make too much sense to have a very great CLI with lots of options and variations and validations, but it doesn't matter if the user uh, doesn't know how to use it, right? So documentation is very important. And uh, well, for CLI apps, basically we need two types of documentation, a synopsis and rich documentation. So synopsis is basically uh, having like short versions of the documentation, uh, like summarized documentations if you want, but also we need rich documentation, detailed documentation that the user can refer to uh, when we, he needs more explanation about how to use uh, the commands uh, and subcommands inside our application. So that's another thing we also need to consider. And 
yeah, if we have subcommands, we need to consider documentation for the subcommands as well. So that's too much, right? Uh, it's too much to think about. And it's not such a, a piece of cake as we could think maybe initially, right? So, well, the question here was, wouldn't it be dreamy if we had a Z library that handles all of this stuff for us so we can focus on our business logic? And as many of you uh, may, may already uh, guessing, that library is ZOCLI. So here I'm going to introduce ZOCLI to you and see how it can help us with all of that stuff we need to consider when implementing production grade command line applications. So what is ZOCLI? So ZOCLI is a library that allows you to rapidly build powerful command line applications powered by Zio. So the keyword here is rapidly, right? So you can still have all of that, all those uh, nice production grade features of command line applications, but you should be able to implement those very quickly. Uh, by the way, here's a link to the GitHub repo. So if you are uh, interested in, in taking a look to the source code or maybe contributing to the library as well, uh, all contributions are welcome. And okay, so now uh, I'm going to show you uh, here a sample application. So I can show you the features of ZOCLI and how you will create your own command line applications. So for that, I'm going to implement a sample application, CSV utils. And this application should have the following subcommands, renaming a column, uh, deleting a column, and uh, moving a column to a different position, changing the separator string. For example, maybe we are using comma separator and we want to change that to pipe. Uh, replicate the given CSV file into several others with the given separators and converting to JSON, allowing a uh, pretty printing. Okay, so those are the requirements. So what's the first step to create a CLI app? It's to create the CLI application entry point. So to do that, it's very easy. You just import zio CLI underscore. And after that, you create the main object of your application. And here you can see I'm creating a CSV util object that extends zio CLI default. So this is very similar to how you create uh, the main object in ZO2, right? In ZO2, you extend ZO app default, but for ZO CLI, we have a ZO CLI default. And this trait requires us to implement this CLI app value here that basically will contain the logic of our command line application. So that's what we need to implement at the end. So that's the first step. The second step is to, to define a pure data structure that models inputs to all possible subcommands. So here, for example, I have a CL trait subcommand, and it contains all the possible subcommands I need to handle, right? So for example, I have renamed column here, and this is a case class that contains uh, all the um, inputs for rename column, right? So rename column re uh, requires an input column, which is a string, a new name for the column, uh, a separator uh, for the CSV file uh, we are trying to process, and the path to the CSV file we are processing. And similarly, we have uh, for delete column, move column, change separator, replicate, and to JSON, right? I'm basically just uh, creating this pure data structure that models inputs to our application. And well, here for this example, I'm applying some functional design techniques. So for example, I'm factoring some commonalities out. Uh, so here, because uh, all the subcommands uh, require a separator and a path to the input CSV, uh, I'm extracting those to a case class. So now, I have transformed the subcommand. It's not a sealed trait anymore. Now it's a case class that contains the common fields. And uh, all the other fields that are not common, I've moved them to this subcommand.info sealed trait. So basically, I have something similar to what I had before, but now I have factored out some commonalities. And well, 
this step is optional, but it was nice for this example. So there you have it. So you can use or case classes or seal traits for having this pure data model uh, of your application inputs. So that was the second step. And the third step is define subcommands themselves. So I have several subcommands, right? I'm going to define the first one here, which is this rename column subcommand. And this rename column will require uh, the following options. I need to provide a column, a new name, and a separator, right? And because these are options, these will be named uh, parameters to the application, right? So how you can create these options is very simple. You use the options data type from uh, the ZOCLI uh, package. So for this line here, I'm creating a column option, which is a text option. So how you create, uh, how you create text options, you call uh, options.text. And here I'm providing a name for the option, right? Which is column. And you can also provide alias for your options. So for example, here I'm providing an alias of C. That means when I call this option in the, when I execute the command line application, I can use this long version column or the short version C. And you can also provide descriptions uh, for your options. So this description will be useful when we want to generate the documentation for our application. And similarly, you can create the other options. Like here, I have the new name option. It's also a string. And I have the separator option. It's also a string. But here, I'm adding uh, the possibility to have a default value, right? So if you call with default in an option, uh, you have the possibility that the user doesn't require to provide uh, that uh, separator option in this case. And in that case, the default value of comma will be used. So you can also define optional uh, options uh, with default values. But well, this rename column also requires an argument. An argument, remember, is an unnamed uh, parameter. And in this case, uh, that will be the input CSV file. So how we can create args? Very simple. Uh, you use the args data type from COCLI. And here I'm defining this argument to be a file, to represent a file. And notice here, I'm also providing a name to this argument, input CSV. And well, maybe now you're thinking, but why you're providing a name to an argument? Wasn't it supposed to be an unnamed parameter? And well, the reason is that, well, this uh, name will be used just for documentation purposes. So, so that's the reason uh, we still uh, provide this name. So the user won't need to write input CSV when executing the CLI, uh, but in the documentation, this input CSV will show up. And also here you can see, I'm requiring the file to exist. So that's an example of impure validation in action. You, you can require that a file exists and that's an interaction with the outside world. So that's impure validation. And well, once you have defined your options and your arguments, you can create the subcommand itself. So to do that, uh, you use the command data type uh, from ZOCLI and you can provide a name for your command. In this case, rename column. You provide the options, and in this case, I have three options, right? So to combine them, it's very easy. You can use the plus plus operator. So this combines all these three options into just one big option. And for this case, I, I just need one argument. So I just provide it. And also you can provide a description for your command that will appear in the documentation. And notice here, the result of doing this is that I have a command with a nested tuple as a type. And that nested tuple is basically reflecting the type of options and arguments I'm providing. So on one side, I'm providing three options. So those three options are strings and they are encapsulated inside a tuple, right? And on the other hand, I have a path, which is the only argument. Uh, I have uh, provided to this command. And well, because that type doesn't look very pretty, I can uh, improve this command by calling map. So map will allow us to change the type of our command. So instead of having that awful nested tuple, I can map and transform it to the nice subcommand data type I have defined in the previous step, right? So 
Now I'm mapping this command to generate a rename column subcommand. And now the type looks a lot nicer, right? I have a command whose type is a subcommand. And that's it. So basically, that's the process to define subcommands. And I can do something similar. Here I'm creating a delete column subcommand. Very easy. You define options, arguments, and create the subcommand. And nothing new there. Something similar here. I'm creating the move column command. Uh, I define options again. Here there is something interesting. Uh, for moving column, I have to define an option uh, that indicates the new position of the column, right? Uh, that new index option. And in this case, uh, this option should be an integer, right? It's not a text anymore. So I can construct integer options as well. And this is basically pure validation in action, right? So when the user introduces a value for new index, a ZOCLI will verify that the provided value is actually an integer and not any string. Uh, here I'm defining the change separator command. Uh, again, very similar. Uh, something special here is that I have this new separator option. Uh, so uh, that will allow me to change the separator of the CSV file, right? And here you can see I'm creating this new separator option and I'm not providing an alias. So you don't always need to define an alias for your, for your options, right? Maybe you want some options to uh, only have a long version. You don't want them to have a short version. So you can do that. That's very flexible. And here I'm creating a replicate command. And the interesting part here is that when defining arguments, I need this new separators argument. So the idea of the replicate command is that you provide an input CSV. It has, for example, a comma as a separator. And you want to create several copies of the CSV file, but with different separators. So uh, those different separators uh, need to be provided as a var. So that's the special thing here. And how you define a var arc, it's very simple. You create a simple arc. In this case, the name of that arc is new separator, and it's a string. Uh, and if you want to transform it into a var arc, you can call the repeat one method on it. So now I have a var arc that requires at least a one value to be provided. So that's why the method is called a repeat one. So here you see var arcs in action. And also another interesting difference here for this replicate command is that now when instantiating the command, now I need to provide several arguments, right? I have two arguments now, not just one. But to combine them, it's very easy. This is exactly the same as in options. You use the plus plus operator to combine two arguments into one. And here I have the to JSON command, the final subcommand, and the interesting part here is that I have this pretty option here. And this pretty will be just a flag. So if the user includes the pretty flag when executing the application, uh, it will generate a pretty JSON. If the flag is not included, uh, the JSON wouldn't be uh, in a pretty format. So this flag is just a Boolean option, right? And because I'm defining this option as a Boolean, a ZOCLI will automatically uh, handle it in this special way, right? So you don't need to provide a value of true or false. Uh, you just need to include the flag or not include the flag. But ZOCLI automatically handles that for you. Uh, also here, another interesting thing is I have an output JSON argument. So I need to provide the file name of the JSON I want to generate, right? And in this case, I'm, I'm requiring that that file doesn't exist, right? So you cannot just check if a file exists. You can also check if a file doesn't exist. And that's it. So I have defined all my subcommands. Now I need to group them together under a root command. And to do that, very simple. Again, you use the command data type. Uh, you provide a name for your root command. In this case, it will be CSV util. Uh, and for this case, uh, the root command itself won't have options and arguments. And after that, you can provide all the subcommands you have defined using the subcommands method. So here, basically, I'm combining all of them into a big root command. And once you have done that, you can create a CLI app that assigns subcommands to handlers. So, so far, we have only defined what subcommands do we have, right? 
and what are the options and arguments, what validations we need to include, the descriptions, right? But we haven't assigned handlers. So we didn't we didn't mention what we want to do when some subcommand gets executed, right? So in that case, uh, well, we have defined everything before, right? And now we can implement this CLI app that is required by the ZO CLI default trait. Right? And to do that is very simple. You use CLI app.make. You provide a name to your application, a version, a summary, a footer. This footer will appear in the documentation if you want at the end, and the root command. And after that, you assign handlers for each subcommand. A handler is basically a function from a subcommand to a zero effect. So your handlers will, will be zero effects that can do anything that you want, right? They can connect to databases, they can call external APIs, they can create files, anything you want. And for example, here I'm defining a handler for the rename column subcommand. And in this case, well, because this is just a sample application, I'm saying that the handler is just a console.println zero effect that will print to the console uh, the inputs that have been provided to the uh, subcommand. And that's basically how you assign uh, handlers to a uh, subcommand. Okay, so that's it. That's basically how you code your application. And once you have done all of that, you can install your application to see it in action. And to install the application, uh, ZOCLI includes an installer script that generates a Graal VM native image for you. Uh, and installs this as an executable on your machine. So why Graal VM? Because we want the C Live to execute very quickly, right? Uh, so this installer script automatically generates that native image uh, for you. You don't, you don't even need to think about that. And now that we have installed the application on our machine, it's time to show you how the application works. Okay, so we have done the effort to create a, our subcommands, assign handlers. So now let's see what ZOCLI will give us by, uh, for free. So here I have an example. Uh, executing the root command with no options and arguments. So what happens? Uh, ZOCLI automatically renders for you the documentation of the application. So you can see that nicely rendered title, CSV util, you can see the version, the description, and you can see a synopsis that shows how to use each subcommand. Very nice, right? And in the left column, for example, for rename column, you can see it accepts this column option, and it has two versions, a short version and a long version, the same for new name. You have a separator, and you know, for example, that this separator is optional. Why? Because it's uh, encapsulated between square brackets, and things like that. Uh, for replicate, uh, you can see that at the end it requires a var new separator, and you know it's a var because it has these three dots here. So a very nice synopsis that gets generated. Uh, you can also execute the root command with the help flag. So this help flag is uh, it comes out of the box in every CLI app. You don't need to define it. Uh, so this help will also show the same documentation page for the root command, but you can also use help with a subcommand. So if you use help with a subcommand, for example, here I'm using this with to JSON, it generates a detailed description for that subcommand specifically. So initially it shows you the synopsis for the subcommand specifically, and after that it shows you more detailed information about the options, the arguments, uh, if some of them is uh, optional, what's the default value, and things like that. What happens if you execute a subcommand with missing arguments, for example? In this case, I'm calling to JSON with no arguments. So you will have these nice errors like here, missing argument input CSV, right? And if you execute a subcommand successfully, well, that means all the validations have passed, the, the user has provided all the inputs. Well, in that case, the handler gets executed, right? And in this case, the handler just prints to the console the inputs, right? So here, for example, you can see uh, it says handling to JSON with pretty equals false. And why? Well, because this pretty, I have defined it as a flag, right? And because the user has it included the flag when calling the command, the value is assumed to be false, right? 
I have the output JSON, the separator equal to comma. Uh, well, the user hasn't provided a separator, right? But the separator has a default value, so that's the one that's being used. And also I have the input CSV there. Uh, you can execute some commands with different variations and options, right? So for example, here I'm calling to JSON again with this separator option, and I'm saying it uh, should be comma. Uh, so this works. I'm separating basically the option and the value with space. I can also use equals to separate the value. And I can also use the short version because I have defined it when creating the application, right? So all of those work out of the box. You can group several flags together. Like here, again, I'm calling to JSON with this pretty flag and the separator flag in the short versions, right? And I can group them together. And the ZOCLI will also automatically recognize that and it should work as well. Pure validation. So I'm calling here move column with a invalid index. So this I is the index option and I'm providing this invalid value. That's not an integer, right? So I get an error. And if I call now with a valid integer, uh, now the command gets executed successfully. So that's pure validation in action. There's also in pure validation working. So here, for example, I'm trying to convert to JSON a file example that doesn't exist. So I get an error for that as well. Varx, I'm calling here the replicate subcommand that accepts an input CSV and a list of separators I want to use to replicate the same file, right? So here I'm providing two separators, dot and colon, and that has been recognized as a varg, and it's encapsulated inside this new separators list. Very nice. So that's a lot of features, right? But there is more. There are some more surprises here. And one of the surprises is that we have automatic misspellings detection and correction. So for example, here I'm calling rename column with a column option instead of column. So I have uh, written it uh, wrong. So it says the flag column is not recognized. Did you mean column? So I have those nice uh, helpers out of the box. I didn't even need to uh, write anything in source code. That comes for free. Uh, there is shell integrated auto completion. And well, actually you don't, you shouldn't need to do anything to enable auto completion. That should work uh, automatically when you install your application. But what happens under the hood is that ZOCLI has this hidden option, shell completion script that comes also out of the box. You don't need to write it by yourself. And if you call your application with this option, that generates a completion script that you can use it to enable auto completion in your uh, shell. So now I have CSV util with nice auto completion for my options, arguments, and subcommands. So that's also another great feature that comes out of the box. Uh, there is this newly added wizard mode that well, I have created up here for this some weeks ago. It's still like an initial version, but you already have it there. So there is a wizard mode for the root command. You can call your command with the wizard flag and the wizard will guide you. It will show what are the available subcommands and what are the options and the arguments you need to provide. So it will guide you through them. At the end, it shows you what is the command that will be executed and the command gets actually executed. And you can also use wizard in subcommands. So if you want to use wizard for a specific subcommand, that also works. So that's great. And again, this will guide the user and render the executed uh, command and it actually executes it. And finally, I have this comparison matrix to comparing ZOCLI to other libraries. So basically, well, there are other libraries in the Scala ecosystem for CLI apps like Decline, Mayark, Scala, Scala, Scoped, Optparse. And I have some interesting features here for comparison. Uh, for example, one, the first one, annotations for customization. So that means it will be nice to have a way to, for example, you in this example here, I have defined my subcommand case class, right? That contains all the inputs to our subcommands. And it will be nice, for example, to have an API that allows us to use uh, annotations to customize the descriptions of each field, for example. Currently, COZLI doesn't have that. 
but it's coming soon. And currently the only libraries that accept annotations for customizing the fields to your, the inputs to your arguments are main arcs and case up. And for the other features, the free ones I've shown you uh, some minutes ago, autocorrection, autocompletion and wizard mode, uh, they are not available in any other of the libraries uh, like the climb, Mayerx and others. They are only available in ZOC line so far. So, well, I think this is uh, nice. Uh, these are nice features that maybe can convince you to start exploring ZOCLI as maybe even contributing to it. It's a very nice library and it fully integrates with Zio, so that's also great. So in summary, CLI apps are very useful for non-developers to interact with your applications. However, writing production great CLI apps is hard. There are very things we need to consider, right? Uh, but actually, it doesn't have to be hard, not with ZOCLI, right? You have seen that you have lots of features out of the box, uh, and that's awesome about this library. So that's it. And now, well, special thanks to Cyverge for organizing this conference, Scalac for sponsoring, and Johnny Goes for support and guidance, as always. And here's my contact information, my Twitter, my LinkedIn, I'm at my email. For anything, you can contact me. And thank you once again for attending today. <laughs>